So, hello everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is the webinar, Tourism and Hospitality Forecasting in Turbulent Times. Actually, the inaugural event of the newly founded uh, Tourism and Hospitality section of the International Institute of Forecasters. My name is Ulrich Gunther. I'm an associate professor at Modul University Vienna. I'm one of the two vice chairs of the THS, and I will be your moderator today. I believe we have prepared a very interesting program for you, and thank you already now for participating. How will we proceed? We will have two short introductory opening speeches, one by Professor Doris Wu from Sun Yat-sen University, the chair of THS, who will introduce you to GSS, and then followed after by a short introductory speech by Professor Gang Li from the University of Surrey, who is the director of the Center for Competitiveness of the Visitor Economy, uh, which is co-organizing this event. <clears throat> then five main speeches by distinguished tourism and hospitality forecasters, both from academia and the industry will follow. And those will be held by Professor Haiyan Song from Hong Kong Polytechnic University, Dr. Jesse Zhao from uh, uh, Hilton, China, followed by Professor Andrea Saiman, the other vice chair of uh, THS from Northwest University. Then we will have a presentation by Steve Hood, senior vice president of research for the Share Center from SDR. And finally, a presentation by Dr. An Yu Yu, the secretary of THS, who is from the University of Surrey. Okay, many thanks again. Uh, Doris, the floor is yours. Thank you, Uli, for the introduction. It is my honor to deliver this opening speech. THS Tourism and the Ho Ho Hospitality Section was established in February of this year, which is a special section under International Institute of Forecasters, IIF. IIF focuses on the development of knowledge on forecasting. It is the most impactful institute in the world uh, on the in the field of forecasting, and it has held 40 academic uh, uh, annual conferences. The establishment of THS contributes to the development and the impact <coughs> enhancement of hotel and tourism forecasting in the communities of both tourism and hotel uh, research and the forecasting research in general. This webinar uh, is the first event of THS co-organized with the Co Cove Center of University of Surrey. In the future, we are going to organize more events uh, regularly, such as uh, uh, seminars, workshops, uh, journal uh, special issues, and uh, forecasting competition. Uh, today, it is my, uh, uh, we sincerely uh, welcome all the uh, scholars and the students to join us if you are interested in tourism and hotel forecasting. At the end, I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere appreciation to the five distinguished speakers today for your kind of support. Thank you very much. And now I'm passing the floor to Uli. Okay, many thanks, stories for this introduction. Just uh, one remark before we move over to Gang, uh, to all attendees, if you have questions to the presenters, please kindly use the Q&A function of Zoom Shorter questions will be answered by the presenters right after their respective presentations and longer or more complex questions will be reserved for the end where we have a general discussion session. Now, Gang, the floor is yours. Thank you, Uli, for your introduction. Hello, everyone. On behalf of COVE, the Research Center for Competitiveness of the Visitor Economy in Surrey, I would like to congratulate the THS committee for setting up this very important platform, connecting tourism and the hospitality forecasting research and other fields of forecasting and facilitating knowledge transfer between each other. COVE is very pleased to form the partnership with THS and promote tourism and hospitality forecasting research together. Tourism forecasting is a long-standing theme of research within the COVE Research Center. I'm very pleased that uh, one of our COVE members, Dr. Anyu Liu, is part of the THS committee and is going to uh, share his research findings today. 
Under this partnership with THS, we are going to jointly organize more webinars, workshops, as Doris said, and also other collaborative activities in the future. I wish THS every success with the future development, and the COF is looking forward to the growth of the partnership and together contributing to the future advancement of the field of tourism and hospitality forecasting research. I hope everybody in the audience can continue to support this field of research. Lastly, I would like to also add my appreciation to the five distinguished speakers from both academia and the industry today for your time and your support to this audience. Back to you, Wuli. Okay, many thanks, Kang. Many thanks for also your support and for the warm words. So this is very much appreciated also. And in order not to lose any time, I think it is a good now to move to the first uh, main uh, speech of today that would be uh, forecasting tourism demand amid COVID-19 and it would be Professor Haiyan Song who is going to talk to you now. Okay, thank you uh, Uli for your introduction. Let me share my screen first. Okay, um, thank you uh, for THS uh, 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 for organizing this uh, webinar, uh, which is uh, very uh, timely and uh, important uh, for the tourism industry and also uh, uh, tourism research. Uh, my topic today is forecasting tourism recovery amid COVID-19. And this study is joint work by uh, uh, Han Yuan Zhang, who actually is uh, attending this uh, webinar and uh, myself and a few, uh, uh, two colleagues from uh, University of Nottingham, uh, uh, Ningbo in China. Uh, this paper actually has just been published in Annals Tourism Research. The latest uh, volume uh, in March is uh, volume 88 in March, 2021. Uh, so if you are interested in uh, the details of this uh, uh, paper, you can have a look at uh, this paper thereafter. Uh, today, uh, due to time constraint, we mainly uh, uh, talk about uh, the methodology that we used uh, in uh, forecasting uh, tourism recovery amid COVID-19, uh, and with some uh, uh, brief uh, uh, result. Uh, so my co my author will be answer the questions. I will do the presentation, so my author will answer the difficult questions uh, after the presentation. So the motivation of this study is that uh, forecasting tourism recovery is crucial for crisis management, especially during the uh, COVID-19 period. Uh, the industry has been uh, negatively influenced and uh, in many destinations, tourism uh, is almost non-existent. Um, in the past, uh, uh, we have used uh, statistical models to generate uh, the demand uh, for tourism in the future uh, when uh, the situation is stable. Uh, but uh, the statistical method now appear to be uh, not very useful uh, given the uh, uh, crisis, especially uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Therefore, to enhance the forecast performance, it is very important to adjust the statistical forecast. So statistical forecast is still very useful. Uh, using uh, judgmental uh, approaches, especially when there's a, a big crisis like COVID-19. Uh, the expert uh, domain knowledge is very useful in adjusting the statistical forecast uh, during this uh, pandemic. So the main contribution of this particular study is to combine um, uh, econometric forecasts with Delphi expert adjustment uh, with a scenario analysis uh, to look at how the tourism will recover uh, in the next few years. And we use Hong Kong as the example. And we, uh, uh, through the forecast of tourism demand, we also can estimate uh, the cost of e economic cost uh, of um, tourism uh, uh, because of COVID-19, uh, since we, if we know the number of uh, arrivals and if we know the uh, average expenditure of tourists, and then we can calculate 
the aggregate cost of uh, COVID-19. Uh, so this actually uh, uh, study will have some uh, methodological and empirical contribution. Uh, uh, so I will uh, illustrate the contribution a bit later. Uh, so if you look at Hong Kong, uh, this diagram demonstrates uh, how badly the tourism had been influenced, uh, impacted. So we have three years uh, figure, 2018, 2019, and 2020. Uh, so you can see, uh, 2018 is normal. Uh, actually, the tourism uh, arrivals uh, increase over the years uh, over, uh, across the four quarters. But when it's come to 2019, uh, you know, 2019, there was uh, social unrest happening in Hong Kong. So in the second half of the year, you can see there's a uh, quite large decline in terms of arrivals. Uh, but if you look at 2020, when uh, uh, during the period of COVID-19, actually there's a, 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 a huge decline in tourism arrivals. It's almost uh, to 80% uh, uh, to 90% decline uh, in the uh, second quarter and third quarter respectively. So that's uh, the reason why the industry is very anxious when uh, the tourism will uh, return a tourist or return when the uh, demand will recover. So this is the, uh, the background of this uh, uh, forecast. Uh, the methodology we are using is known as a scenario-based Delphi adjustment approach. So the, this approach uh, can be divided into three stages. So the first stage, basically, uh, we're using historical data to estimate uh, the econometric models are taking into consideration of the influencing factors, uh, standard uh, demand uh, uh, model. Uh, and then the, the econometric model is known as uh, autoregressive distributed error correction models. And we do a lot, uh, uh, all the tests uh, of the models to make sure that the models are correctly specified and perform well. And the second stage is to uh, after the estimation uh, estimates of the model, so then we uh, generate the baseline forecast. But be before we generate baseline forecast, we need to forecast the exp explanatory variables. And the explanatory variables was forecast using uh, seasonal exponential smoothing. So that's uh, uh, the approach that has been used by other uh, uh, scholars as well. And then we generate the baseline forecasting using the data actually up to 2019, end of 2019, uh, to generate forecasts for 2020 and 2021, 2023. Uh, uh, so, but uh, these forecasts are actually uh, uh, based on the econometric model, assuming there's no uh, impact of a major crisis. But since the major crisis occurred, so the baseline forecast will not be uh, relevant. So we have to make adjustments uh, to the baseline forecast uh, using judgmental approach. So these are the uh, three stages. In terms of model, actually, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, slide shows the econometric model or uh, ARDL ECM model, uh, which basically uh, consider all the influencing factors uh, in both uh, uh, growth and uh, level uh, forms. Uh, and the last three, uh, the last actually a uh, few variables in levels actually are the error correction term and the, uh, the dependent variable and also the first few uh, terms are the growth of tourist arrivals, uh, income, uh, uh, price and relative price, uh, substitute price and so on and so forth. So this uh, is a standard uh, ADM uh, error correction model. And this uh, table present uh, part of the modeling uh, result. Uh, as you can see, most of the uh, estimated coefficient have correct sign and the magnitude uh, also fall into our expectation. And the bottom uh, test A, B, C, D are the diagnostic statistics, uh, which testing the normality, heteroscedasticity, uh, I think structure break and serial correlation. Uh, so you can see most of the model pass those uh, tests, but China, the, the model associated with mainland China, actually uh, uh, the model uh, 
uh, did not pass all these uh, diagnostic uh, statistics. Uh, the reason being is that chi the extra arrival from China uh, are very much influenced by policy and the sentiment uh, between uh, the uh, residents of Hong Kong and uh, the Chinese uh, tourists. So that's why it is uh, uh, suffers some uh, misspecification problems. And we came across the same issue when we uh, doing other projects. So this is not surprising. And uh, in terms of the panel, actually we compiled, we are uh, uh, quite a large panel consists of 17 experts. Uh, the panel is uh, diversified in terms of their stature, uh, background, knowledge, skills, and affiliation. And also uh, the size is reasonable. We have a 17 expert and 82% of the expert have more than fair forecasting knowledge. So if you look at the bottom uh, table, you can see these are their self-evaluation in terms of their knowledge of forecasting. Some of them uh, have a zero, actually none of them have a zero knowledge uh, and the two have a, a little knowledge and the six have a fair bit of a forecasting uh, skills. Uh, six has good skill and three have a, a very uh, excellent forecasting uh, knowledge. And the first table, uh, the table on the top, uh, list uh, those uh, experts uh, from both academics and the industry. And all the industry experts are, most of them at uh, corporate level. There's only one at the department, uh, department level, but that is in the corp uh, corporate uh, department, which uh, is also a sig significant position, uh, have a good understanding of uh, tourism industry in Hong Kong. So these are the panel. And uh, this questionnaire survey, actually, the Dalphi survey was carried out uh, in June and July uh, to that last year. So it's the, in the middle of uh, uh, the pandemic. And also the first round, we only ask uh, two questions. The first question is, uh, do you agree that tourist arrival from each uh, source market would reach to the bottom in 2020, uh, quarter two? And basically this is just ask them to confirm uh, that the tourism arrival has reached the bottom. But if they don't agree, they can suggest uh, in which quarter the bottom will be uh, reached in terms of arrivals. The second question is when uh, the number of arrivals from uh, origin will return to the baseline forecast. So they will, uh, the expert will uh, suggest uh, uh, when it will return to the baseline forecast. Actually, the expert will present it with the baseline forecast. Uh, uh, at, at, uh, in the first part of the questionnaire. And also the second round survey, we uh, only ask uh, one question after uh, the, uh, the questionnaire completed in the first round and compiled, aggregated, and then we uh, present uh, the panel with the adjusted forecast. Uh, so we ask, uh, uh, expert in the second uh, round to select the appropriate percentage increase or decrease of adjusted forecast if they think it is uh, too low or too high. So in the second round, basically there's only one uh, question asked uh, uh, for the expert to adjust their forecast again. But remember, we have uh, 16 source market uh, arrival to Hong Kong and each source market, we had three uh, scenarios uh, so there's a lot of uh, information. If you ask too many questions, uh, the uh, expert will not be able to cope uh, with all this information. Uh, so the, uh, after the second round uh, survey, actually the uh, response actually will convert uh, based uh, on uh, statistic, some statistics. So we stopped after second round. And this actually is, uh, uh, shows uh, the forecast result. Um, uh, you can see the, uh, the actual uh, data in blue and then the adjusted forecast and also baseline forecast uh, presented in color at the end of these uh, uh, curves. Uh, these are the adjustment. As you can see, uh, the difference between the three scenarios uh, actually is uh, not uh, that great. It's quite close. Later, I will talk about why uh, this is the case. From this result, we can see uh, 
uh, the, uh, we can, uh, uh, the source market would divide it into three groups. Uh, the color change actually uh, highlighted uh, the speed of recovery. And also you can Professor see from Song, this... Sorry to interrupt, just you have one to two more minutes. Okay. <laughs> and then the, um, uh, the three groups, you can see the first group with a, a light color, so fast recovery, and then uh, followed by uh, some uh, source market from Asia. And then uh, the last uh, uh, group, actually most uh, long uh, short, uh, sorry, long haul market, uh, they recover uh, relatively slow, especially United States. Okay, we also calculate the to total tourism uh, uh, income losses due to this uh, uh, you know, decline uh, of uh, arrivals due to time uh, constraint. I'm not going to uh, explain it uh, any further. So the limitation of this study actually um, uh, mainly coming from the reason why the scenarios are not, that, uh, are not wide enough is perhaps because the following limitations. The first uh, uh, type of uh, bias actually came from optimistic and desirability and anchorage uh, bias. As we know, uh, the industry uh, the industry expert, uh, because they are in the industry, they are quite uh, optimistic in terms of recovery. And also they design the industry to recover. So that's actually the uh, bias may be built in in the survey. And also anchorage uh, bias, because we provide them with, uh, uh, with uh, the baseline forecast. Actually, they already have something in mind. Okay, this is a baseline. Now, how far it should be, uh, should I adjust from the baseline? This actually is another bias uh, uh, we call it, uh, uh, anchorage bias. Another bias is uh, boundary rationality because there's so much information presented to the expert uh, given the number of uh, source market. Uh, uh, we're trying to forecast. There's a lot, lot of information. They have to digest the introductory information present to them. So uh, in, in that sense, they do not have uh, enough capacity to observe all this information. Therefore, uh, bias uh, may be uh, uh, you know, introduced in the forecasting process. I think that's what I have to say, and uh, I will leave uh, uh, the time for Q&A. Thank you. Okay. Many thanks, Professor Song, for that very uh, insightful presentation, also very important presentation. And I think all questions that have appeared so far in the Q&A box have been already answered by Han Yuan. So there don't seem to be uh, any others. I mean, if any attendee comes up with one related to this topic later on, they can also do that, uh, do that of course, in the general discussion section. So then let's move over to uh, Dr. Jesse Zhao. Senior Regional Director of Finance of Hilton China and his presentation topic, the hotel demand forecast under critical situations. The floor is yours. Right. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, so as uh, my name is Jesse Zhao, come from China, Hilton, uh, Hilton China as a Senior Director of Finance. So today my topic is uh, hotel demand forecast under critical situation, mainly focus on how hotel is making focus during pandemic. And there will be some really practical examples, not like a uh, Professor Song's uh, uh, very academic. Uh, I will take a little bit of time to uh, talk about uh, hotel focus in a normal circumstance, and then we could have a basic comparison. Uh, so hotel focus is based on a realistic and developed day by day for the revenue and the EBITDA generation. It which the rate and the how many rooms can you sold, can you sell uh, for every uh, future day. It will be developed by market segment and then uh, right in the with uh, monthly focus, quarterly, yearly, and so on. Uh, so uh, the hotel forecasting and the budgeting demand is that the basic demand elements are right part of last year and the group of event last year. Uh, demand level indicator uh, last year, like a, a, a high, medium, low uh, uh, district uh, uh, period. And demand level indicator of this year and the consideration of uh, public holidays, school holidays, except, exceptional demand indicators, such as big events, city events, and the national events. Yeah. Uh, 
why this is important? Because it will help to predict, uh, predict uh, consumer demand and the challenges, the resources in importance of gathering information. And uh, it also can help to stimulate demand in a uh, slower period. So uh, decision making under revenue, revenue management and uh, focus uh, must be based on clients and uh, that this is uh, what, what is your uh, main clients and uh, uh, what, uh, who, will, uh, who will stay in your hotel and what is the pricing and also the uh, history of the hotel in the past and also your, your competition and there's a, if any, there's a, any events and also uh, what is your distribution channels. Uh, so the principles and the elements of uh, effective, so the basic uh, element, uh, elements and the ingredients in you, uh, you need to apply effective of uh, hotel revenue management will be market segment, histor historical demands and the uh, booking patterns, uh, demand and focus, uh, the pricing inventory management, uh, whether you can uh, uh, better manage uh, management of uh, overbooking and also as well as the information systems. Uh, talk about the market segments. So the market segment helps the identifying the trend of your business. Uh, for instance, the lines of stay and the days of vague stays and also uh, whether you are a business hotel or a, uh, or a leisure, leisure hotel, and the total revenue per room, total revenue per client, and the booking lead time and the pace, and the cancellation per, uh, percentage, and the no-show ratios. Those are the uh, uh, market second considerations. Uh, also, we need to develop a hotel booking curve. So all the cancellation will be taken into consideration on revenue curve. So it's uh, like uh, identifying your hot days and uh, what is expected, if not, uh, then analyze, understanding, understand, and uh, what, what uh, can you influence, how it is effective of your forecasting, and are you losing any opportunities? Those are the also need to be considered, uh, like uh, you need to analyze the impact on your forecast, which is affected by selling strategy, Mm. So you need you need to also uh, understand the, uh, the some factors like a top top account set, set, uh, expectations and anticipate the top account production. Uh, speaking of one main corporate uh, account clients, and know your sales strategy and uh, analyze how it will affect your global strategy also. Uh, for uh, the accuracy of your hotel focus is also very important. Uh, this will be your uh, uh, focus is the key to hotel prof uh, profitabilities also. And uh, the variances may be caused by incre incorrect booking. So make sure those segment is correct. Uh, room blocks are well uh, updated for all uh, defined groups, evaluating your group tentative and uh, apply a materialized factor. So uh, a no duplication, no duplicated bookings, all reservations uh, has been entered into, into your uh, computer system, take out oversold rooms on expectation cancellations and the correct rate or rate code for block rooms and reservations. Uh, also, um, for making a good forecasting, you need to uh, benchmarking, benchmark your hotel uh, position. So benchmarking is a key topic of forecasting management. Uh, those, those benchmarks, and you need to be following like a price, prices, products, level of service, location, and also distribution channels. And also you need to uh, make a risk shopping like uh, what is your competi competition around around you? Uh, what 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 is their pr um, pricing? Pro probably you will uh, shopping like uh, at least once a week or making some uh, periodical pricing uh, shopping. Uh, those are some e examples and the charts.
uh, and also you need to uh, evaluating uh, two steps of your uh, under, uh, analysis your hotel value, identifying the strat uh, strengths and weaknesses of your hotel, and develop a checklist to evaluate your computer uh, competitors in terms of your products and the, and the quality score of your competitors. And also you need to ask some questions whether your hotel uh, pricing strategy is making sense and choose a cl uh, clear uh, pricing pos uh, positioning strategy for your room rate and that will be help you strengthen your value percentage of, uh, of your consumers. Mm. Uh, also, you need to ask a question whether your hotel have a, a correct uh, distribution channels. Uh, probably in, in China, we use Ctrip or maybe uh, outside the world using Google to, identi uh, to identify distribution opportunities. So make sure you are on the internet distribution channel that promote your destination online. And uh, there are some key uh, index. Uh, we are not going to uh, talk about detail. So you need to understand MPI, ARI, RGI, those are the uh, forecasting uh, index, a uh, key index. So uh, hotel focus management uh, uh, can also help to predict and stimulate the consumer demand and to optimize the inventory and the pricing uh, av availability in order to maximize profit, not only at the time of high interest, but also during low period. So the, uh, then we are uh, coming to the focus during uh, academic, and we'll talk about the uh, real case happened in China. So focusing uh, epidemic uh, will be, uh, have some really differences uh, compared with the normal time, what we, we just uh, illustrated. Uh, so in normal time, we, pr uh, we compare year on year and uh, um, for instance, uh, 2020 compared to 2019. However, in the academic period, uh, there will be like months on months uh, uh, focus and uh, even week on week. Our, our, uh, so this is a, the, the compare period will be re really short. And uh, the concern uh, probably will uh, uh, focusing on occupancy because uh, the opportunities is uh, not as normal as normal time, but uh, will be like a penet penetration. We, we need to get uh, the business in. So focus on occupancy uh, instead of ADR, uh, but uh, to, to build up the uh, cash flow, uh, you, you need to have a, a correct cash in to the hotel. And also, uh, focus consideration not only limited to the areas city you are in, but also widely open to the whole country. So, the, uh, for instance, uh, the, if the uh, like, like uh, COVID nineteen when the, when it hits to China, uh, uh, for especially after uh, the Wuhan time, there will be a, another uh, three or four time uh, uh, waves uh, hitting uh, some China China cities, especially the North China. So you need to also consider uh, a city like a uh, country like a whole. And uh, if you want to really compare with last year, 2019, the normal year, probably uh, you consider with the uh, target achievement in percentage, uh, seeing, seeing a trend, uh, like a normal time, uh, uh, what, what is the percentage of achieving uh, last year target instead of a real comparison with, with those figures. And uh, for market segment, that will be need a reclassification of uh, uh, for the fact that there's a no really mass business, but instead of uh, uh, there's a no uh, uh, group, uh, really mass group business, but uh, uh, focus on individuals. Uh, for the corporate uh, business, uh, the reservation, we, we found out that the reservation are usually generated from OTA instead of uh, really uh, corporate accounts because they are uh, seeing OTA probably lower price. So this, this, those we need to uh, identify uh, those uh, corporate business from the OTA. But uh, later on, we'll, we'll see uh, how, how we could uh, 
uh, find out what what are the corporate business from the OTA. Uh, I, I don't know whether you understand in China when when those uh, company a bit uh, when these uh, people who are, who are on a business trip who stay in the hotel they usually ask Hua Piao. Uh, this is like a like an invoices to to claim from the company. Uh, but usually the OTA pleasure people will not ask in Hua Piao. So we need to really identify all those uh, business from OTA who who is uh, asking Hua Piao from the hotel. Uh, the emails from the hotel, then we can identify the, uh, the real source of business. And also, uh, uh, last, I will talk about uh, some, some of the hotel are used as uh, for medical staff or for quarantine business. For instance, the uh, uh, airline from outside, outside China, when they arrive in China, they are requesting for uh, 14 days or 21 days quarantine, stay in the, in the hotel. Usually those hotels will be closed to the public, but usually, uh, uh, mainly for quarantine or medical staff. Uh, for those hotels, when they, when they close, uh, you, you, they, and then uh, for a period of time, uh, we need to have a, like, like a pr preparation of action plan prior for reopen, like uh, what, uh, to, uh, make up some strategy. For instance, one month before they reopen or two weeks before reopen and the making strategy, strategies for the actions after reopen and the, what, what, can, uh, what the hotel can do and can sell as a normal business. Uh, so um, those are the, my topic for today, uh, talking about uh, uh, focus in the normal circumstance and, the real, and the also what has happened during the pandemic uh, the hotel uh, making their focus in a, a tough, tough situation. Thank you. Perfect, uh, Dr. Zhao, many thanks uh, for your insights from the hospitality industry that was perfectly in time. Uh, I think I saw there's one uh, uh, question related to you about mm -hmm. how important is forecasting for repeat lo loyal guests in the pandemic scenario how factors can be taken into consideration. Is this something you could answer right away or should we rather uh, say postpone this to the discussion later on? Uh, so the question, I, I just, actually I didn't see those questions is uh, how, uh, how important for loyalty? Uh, exactly, for repeat loyal guests in oh, the pandemic. For loyal guests. Well, if uh, those, those are, of, of course it's very important for hotel to still recognize, recognizing those uh, uh, repeat VIP loyalty guests. So we need to really take good care of them. Uh, even those, even in the tough situation, uh, uh, we need to um, provide their safety space. For instance, that, that in Hilton worldwide, we are uh, taking some measures like a clean stay to make mm -hmm. sure your, your hotel was not touched by any, anybody else after uh, the, those actions are taken and the, let, let them to feel to stay in the Hilton Hotel is very safe. And uh, uh, after the pandemic, they can still patron uh, the Hilton, Hilton Hotels. Okay, Thank perfect. You. Many thanks. Yes, safety, security has become a very important issue now. Uh, cleanliness, especially even more so uh, for, for tourists nowadays. Good, many thanks. In order, I guess Thank this you. could answer the question to, to, to a large extent. So let's uh, move over to Professor Simon from Northwest University and her presentation about judgmentally adjusted model-based forecasts of visitor arrivals during COVID-19, which was also part of the forecast competition, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you, Ulrich. Let me just share my screen here for everybody to see. So yes, um, my paper or my talk today is about judgmentally adjusted model-based forecasts um, during COVID-19. And my presentation is heavily based on a paper that I did with some of my colleagues, uh, Nicolas Corenzis, um, Philippe Jean-Pierre, David Provazzano, Wanda Sali, Daniel Citram, and uh, Serena Vola. And also you can read this paper in Annals of Tourism Research. So to start off just the layout of my presentation today, Firstly, I'm just going to set the scene to say what, what's been happening with COVID-19 and tourism. 
And then I'm going to talk a bit more about why using judgment in tourism forecasting and why do, don't we always use judgment? And specifically then focusing the, the third part on, on tourism, how it has been incorporated in previously in tourism forecasting. And then I'm going to focus on the case study of what we did and how we incorporated um, judgment into our model-based forecast. So to set the scene, um, while there has been a number of shocks to tourism over the past three decades, no other disease or international shock has disrupted tourism the way that COVID-19 has. All other shocks was mainly regional. So if you think, for example, of SARS in 2003, and you can see it nicely below here in the Singapore graph, or if you think of the bird flu pandemic or MERS um, in 2012, which you can also clearly see in the J Japan time series below, or even if, if you think about Ebola in 2013 and 14 in Western Africa, all those have been very regionally based. But um, COVID-19 is different because within a couple of months, 72% of all destinations lock their borders for international travel, making this a truly global crisis. So there's no historic data on the effect of the, and the uncertainties involved in such a global pandemic. And this has increased the uncertainty in our models significantly. The uncertainty comes from various sources. For example, how will governments react? How long will the pandemic last? And how will a possible recovery look like? And when will it take place? So all these are typically things that models can't tell us because they are based on historic data. So the data below shows you just the effect that COVID-19 had. So you can see the steep fall for all countries, Australia, Japan, and Singapore. And this has never been seen before. So because models depend on previous data and that data doesn't exist, um, judgment becomes much more important in forecasting under these circumstances. So the main reasons why theoretically we would add judgment to our forecast is to elicit knowledge from experts um, based on their expert opinions. So, for example, when there is something like an Olympic Games happening to say, I'm taking expert opinion to say what will typically happen in such circumstances. Um, this is also, we also use experts because models cannot capture the current context. So what is currently happening since models are based on historic data. And then thirdly, models are known to be quite inaccurate in times of uncertainty. Um, when there is uncertainty in the world, there's three sources of the, that uncertainty. So firstly, we would say, what is the cause of the shock? Uh, what caused this uncertainty? In COVID-19's case, we know the uncertainty comes from the pandemic. And um, secondly, we would, we would like to know what is the magnitude of the shock? So this still is, is not clear even in the current pandemic. Um, lastly, we're always uncertain about the timing. How long will it last before it goes away? Um, so given this, that, that is reasons why we always include judgment in our forecast in, in these times. Um, how do we use this judgment? So typically you can take three routes. You can go purely judgmental and say, I'm going to, going to just ask people, what do they think? And then I have a judgmental forecast. Now this is done quite rarely um, in academia. It's more, uh, it's more prevalent maybe in practice, but not so much in academia. Um, secondly, you can say, I do my quantitative models and then I ask experts or people to adjust, uh, adjust, uh, to adjust the forecast based on judgment because they have the current context. The third reason is, or well, the third way you can do it is just to get, get a couple of models, including a judgmental model, and just um, mix them all together and therefore combine the forecast. So these are the reasons why we use judgment, but why don't we always use judgment? So some of the practical reasons are that taking, uh, getting experts to take part is time consuming and in some cases can be quite expensive. But another reason is that human judgment is always biased at, due to heuristics and heuristics are mental short, shortcuts that people take to make decisions. So the areas that are affected um, in terms of bias is in the selection of information, in your information processing and in your personologism. In other words, if you have to select information, 
people tend to look at the most recent data or um, information that's available. There's also anchoring, which we would look at the information, the initial information that anchors your, your choice or your judgment, and the availability of information. So what can you recall and what can you not recall? And um, how much supporting evidence are there for the facts? In your information processing, for example, we tend to not consistently apply the criteria um, in all circumstances. And we are quite skeptical of changing our opinions, so we are quite conservative in adjusting our opinions. And um, finally, we also say that failure is just based on bad luck, but success is due to my skills. Personologism is uh, based on things like optimism. So you, you are optimistic and therefore you think things are going to, to clear up early. And also you might underestimate the uncertainty and just rely on past patterns. So there's a famous quote or a nice quote I, I read about on, in a paper by Lim and O'Connor who suggested that uh, people tend to put too much emphasis on their own ability to forecast rather than relying on model forecast. And they said that people do not seem to learn. In fact, they actually get worse over time. So um, judgmental forecasting has been implied in tourism as well. Um, although most tourism demand forecasting studies still use quantitative techniques. If you just look at, the, at all the um, review papers, you'll see there's a lot of emphasis on quantitative techniques and not that much on um, how, how we use judgment or other qualitative techniques. Uh, the 2003 paper by Prudhoe et al. Et al said that if there are crises or uncertainties, setting scenarios and using expert opinions must be part of your forecasting process. Uh, in fact, most, most papers prove to us that judgment not only improve our forecasts, but it also reduces the variance, in other words, the risks in our forecasting decisions. So combining statistical and judgmental forecasts has been um, studied in tourism and Actually, systems have been put up like the decision support system and the web-based forecasting system to incorporate both judgment and um, statistical forecast. The most popular technique that's used in the tourism literature is the Dalphi technique, the one that uh, Professor Song also talked about earlier. And, um, the, in, and the Dalphi technique shows us that um, the judgment bias becomes lower in a group. In other words, if there's uh, more people together and they can talk and adjust their, their uh, judgments, the bias tend to be, get lower and your um, forecast tend to become more accurate. However, whenever you use judgment, bias is still present, including, as Professor Song also highlighted, anchoring recency and optimism. And therefore, Lemon O'Connor and Lawrence Edmondson O'Connor therefore says that it's rather better to mechanically combine your judgmental and your um, uh, statistical forecast. So just the case study that we've done. So this was part of the forecasting competition where we had to forecast 120 arrival series to 20 countries spread over five continents. Um, we use quantitative model selection based on um, forecasts before COVID, and then we extrapolated that obviously for the COVID period 2020 Q1 to 2021 Q4. So it's quarterly forecasts, and that model then became the baseline scenario. But quantitative models cannot take account of them of the recent data. It, it does not know what the shock is doing to, to tourism uh, because it's based on historic data. So for example, if you look at, at this, this is what we as analysts know. We know that is the growth in the pandemic, the blue line. And we also know how governments are responding by adding restrictions, travel restrictions, where forward is total travel restrictions. Um, and this is not accounted for in, in data. So. For our case study, the nature of our problem was related to the magnitude of the task. So if we were to ask humans to produce forecasts for each country origin pair, we would ask them to adjust 924 forecasts just for one year. And we all know that high cognitive overload leads to low cognitive accuracy. So to take account of that, we opted for a structured approach and we say, well, while we don't know how to predict the pandemic, maybe government's behavioral response might be quite easier. So 
how we structured it is to ask participants to provide binary decisions on when will travel be restricted and when will travel be limited between this different destination origin regions for each quarter. So for every quarter, we would have something like this. Between North and uh, Africa, North Africa, there would be unrestricted travel with a zero, for example, this uh, analyst expected, but um, between North Africa and North America, there would be restricted travel. Um, so secondly, when we said, well, obviously, if there's unrestricted travel, it still doesn't mean that you are, we are 100% where we, where we were pre-COVID. Uh, pre so um, we asked them, what is that maximum recovery percentage? So we limited the, the cognitive task to do. And based on that, we averaged the participants' input to reduce bias and uncertainty. So averaging um, reduces the bias. And and it led to something like this. So one would be super restricted travel, and this is how the uh, analysts in average would see things um, opening up over the course of the year and a half. So I neglected to say that this was done in um, August, September of 2020. So it's only show for 2020 quarter four onwards. So once we have done this, it was sent to a couple of experts to just say, well, are we on the correct track? Are we over optimistic? Even if we are a number of analysts taking part in this exercise, um, are we over optimistic? And how should we, can we adjust these paths of recovery that we do see? So step four, when then after the um, analyst had it with him, was to say, well, let's combine it in some way. And we opted for the mechanical combination or adjustment of our model forecast. And um, the scheme that we used um, had to take in a, a scaling factor called alpha. And then alpha would take on different values. So for alpha equals 0 0.1, we would say that there's a, a slower recovery. And, um, and then for alpha equals uh, 1, it would be sort of a, what we expected, et cetera. So this would be uh, reflect the pessimistic, likely, and optimistic scenarios. So the result of all this would look something like this. So this is just one of the countries that we used. And the model forecasts are the ones in, in purple, and you can see how far off they are. And then we have the mild, the medium, and the very severe scenario. So under the severe scenario, Given what, what our experts expected, we only expect around, uh, on total, about a 35% recovery by the end of 2021, which I think would be more, more likely at this stage than some of the optimistic scenarios. And the so to interrupt, you have one more minute. Thank you. I'm on my last slide. So Perfect. Just in summary, then. So what is the advantage of, of using this type of judgmental approach? Well, judgmental all in all, um, is a good approach to use because you can add contextual information in your forecast that models cannot take account of. Um, if you have a large task like we had to do, we have, we've implemented a very uh, easy system um, that can be replicated uh, by others as well. Uh, using such a system mitigates the judgmental bias because we don't ask people to adjust series, we just ask them view, their view on travel restrictions. So this is limited cognitive load for, for people to, to take account of. Uh, also, we did not anal have analysts talking to one another, so we limited anchoring um, in that sense and everyone can choose their own type of, of bias. And um, by averaging it, we are, we are getting rid of some of the bias. So we also don't ask for an exact value, just on a view. And this is a very scalable approach. In other words, more participants will lead to less bias. The disadvantage is then again, the questions of experts. So we collected responses and average it and then ask for expert opinions. But, um, so we have used experts in two ways. Um, the second disadvantage is the sensitivity of the number of participants and the weighting of the scenarios that we use. It's not clear how good that are, how good that will pan out for us in this competition. And then lastly, um, because we only didn't uh, we didn't ask them to motivate why they choose anything, we don't know whether some of the analysts was overconfident and what type of biases was present in their, their um, decisions. 
So, and um, thank you for your attention. This is all from our side. Perfect. Uh, many thanks for that very intriguing uh, presentation, Andrea. Since there is no question at the moment, and in order not to run out of time, I would uh, like to just move over to Steve Hood for his presentation. And this will be about diverse recovery of the hotel in the global hotel industry. Even The floor is yours, Steve. Thank you very much. Good to be with everybody this uh, today. And uh, can everybody see my screen OK? Good. Hospitality and tourism forecasting in turbulent times. Uh, I have a lot of material here, I've so I'll go a little quick. I apologize for uh, moving quick. I definitely um, can get these slides to anybody who would like them, but I'd like to make 10 points related to uh, uh, forecasting. This is a little STR by the numbers. I think everybody knows who we are, but um, important to emphasize if you're, as long as you're an academic, we make the data that I'm sharing available uh, to you uh, for free, and and so so let us know if you'd like to see uh, more and and especially personalized data for your particular area of the world. So pro point number one, the current situation related to COVID is unprecedented. Uh, just to uh, uh, to emphasize that. The, these are 2020 occupancies from different regions of the world. Work, uh, no surprise, 2020 was the worst year in history of the hotel industry. And look at some of these areas. Uh, the dark green number is uh, 2020 occupancy. Compare that to the light green number, which was uh, 2019 occupancy. You look at Europe, 33 compared to 72. You know, uh, Asia, 39 compared to 72. No surprise there. Uh, economic cycles. This is just a one country sample country for uh, sample data for the US showing percent changes in the various economic cycles. Look at 2001 and then 2009 and then boom 2020 bottom just felt falls out of uh, out of these metrics. But you know a little good news you do see uh, uh, that occupants and ADR beginning to turn around. So uh, so that's good news. Um, point number two, there are no real adequate points of comparison. Andrea mentioned SARS. You know, I, I still remember at the beginning, people were thinking, well, this is going to be similar to SARS. SARS rebounded in six months. Nah, it didn't. It wasn't, wasn't that way, was it? And then people started thinking, well, what about the global financial crisis? Uh, should be coming back, you know, should go down just, you know, not too much. And then and, and coming back, not, not the case as well. Point number three, traditional an, uh, analysis methods had to be invented. Uh, I saw uh, somebody had a uh, presentation recently that said, honey, we broke the chart. And, uh, and uh, that's been the case. Of course, one of the big stories in COVID is the number of hotel closures. And that's had a major impact upon traditional metrics. Think about it. If, uh, if you're looking, if you're trying to track what's going on in Spain, Spain uh, closed at one point in time, 80% of the hotels were closed in the country of Spain. So only 20% were left. If the 20% that were left had a 25% occupancy, then what was the occupancy in Spain? Was it 25% or was it 5%? Well, it was both, really. So, you know, we've had to adapt to totally new uh, metrics and measurements. We call that TRI, total room inventory. So that's tracking the occupancy back to the hotels were open in 2009 compared to just the hotels that are open right now. Here's the 2020 occupancies. This time I'm comparing standard occupancy formula back to the total room inventory occupancy methodology. So we have a whole new methodology just related to COVID. A look at RevPAR percent changes. Again, total year RevPAR percent changes for regions of the world. And look at some of these negative numbers. I mean, Europe, uh, negative 62, but the total room inventory uh, uh, rev par percent change is negative 72. And, and, and look at some of these differences. You know, when the percent changes become so big, yeah, it's really sort of hard to interpret that. You know, look at, again, another country, U.S., where uh, rev par percent change at the worst month went down to negative 80 percent. Now it's back to you know, positive 34%. Now I've seen, you know, that's for a whole country. When you're looking at rev par percent changes for specific cities, I, you know, I saw a rev par percent change of 250% recently, but that, you know, think of it, if your occupancy drops to, you know, 20% and then, you know, jumps, you're going to have weird numbers like that. So what have we had to do? We've gone back and started indexing to 2019 levels. This shows U.S. data 
index back to 2019. So you set a baseline and then measure how is it doing back to uh, that previous uh, that previous example. That's just one example of things we've had to do. Um, other examples I list on the bottom there, uh, and, and uh, Jesse mentioned that this week versus last week has become real popular. Are we going up or are we going down? All the new correlations we're doing, we're correlating data to things we never even dreamed of before. Quarantine business, when hotels in Singapore are 80% full, but it's all quarantine business. Is that really occupancy or, or not? How do, you, how do you judge that? Point number four, we've run out of different recovery scenarios. I love it when people try to put a recovery scenario and attach it to a letter, you know? Uh, is it a V, is it a U, is it an L, is it a W? Well, here's one we came up with at one point. It's a W with drag, you know? And then there's a WW or a W and a lowercase W. Then people start comparing various parts of the letters, the first down and up versus the second down and up. I mean, people were, you know, figuring out all kinds of different things. How many lockdowns, how many different waves, you know, I've, I've, you know, that's all a personal preference and it's dependent upon where exactly you are, you know, lockdown, is this lockdown 2.0 or 3.0? In some cases it's 4.0. Here's data uh, for sample countries in Europe. If you look at some of those, we're in 4.0. Here's sample data for countries in Asia and, and you see lots of different, uh, the different letters uh, when it comes to the recovery scenarios. One of the, uh, it'll be, uh, it'll come up later. Point number five, all hotels are not created equal. And this has been a big misconception. Everybody thinks that every hotel is doing awful and it's not the case. Again, one country, but look, there has always been a group of hotels that are in that top bucket uh, with, with greater than 60% occupancy, even during the worst part of the uh, pandemic. So it's a misconception to think that every hotel is doing awful. Again, all destinations are, cre are not created equal. I can't tell you the presentations I've done recently, it's like diversity I, you know, is, is like on every slide, it seems like. You know, here's just one example of it. Here are destinations in, in uh, China. Sanya actually beat 2019 numbers in 2020. So here's a destination resort that outperformed the prior year in the midst of a pandemic. Look the other examples I have up there. Maldives hit 80% at the end of the year. Darwin off the charts. Sochi off the charts. Algarve, really good. Swiss ski resorts. When you're the only uh, ski resort in Europe that's open, you're... You're, you're, you're not uh, suffering too as much. Uh, uh, other places, Cotswold, Dubai, Cairo, if you go to the US, we were jo I was joking with some people, Gatlinburg, nobody's ever heard of these destinations that are doing, uh, doing well. Uh, you know, Miami Beach, no good. Myrtle Beach, doing just fine. Parks, outdoor tourism, it, just so many different scenarios. And of course, uh, different types of business and this is sort of uh, uh, a recovery chart that we uh, that we created. You know, at this point in time, we're seeing leisure business, we're seeing domestic business, and as we transition, you know, we'll see the business traveler coming back, and then eventually events and groups coming back. We'll go from domestic to international. You see changes right now, policy changes as uh, uh, right now related to international travel all over the world. Here's a, here's a chart on group business and just showing you the demand drop for group business. So, and no surprise, meeting and event business has just been decimated. It, the demand is down to negative 84. But you do see, you know, in this one area, a little bit of a, uh, of a change. Now, of course, that's small group business. It's not meeting and events. So it's hard. You know, when will meeting and events come back? That's, you know, that's really hard to, uh, to predict and, and uh, we'll have to keep watching to uh, see that. Point number eight, a lot of external factors, a lot of variables that, are, that, that make this prediction so difficult. You know, the, the worst case, best case, or the mild, severe, you know, those are wide ranges in terms of uh, uh, the companies that are doing forecasts. We forecast with tourism economics, they always, you know, are big into that, and and but those uh, those uh, those that bandwidth has uh, increased a lot in a situation like what we're talking about. Uh, point number nine: hotel industry recovery is complicated. Remember, it involves multiple metrics. I mean, here's an example, but keep in mind when you're talking recovery, you have demand that recovers, just the raw room nights sold. You have occupancy that recovers, and one interesting thing during this uh, situation is. The supply is still coming in. You know, India, 
you know, could potentially have more hotels that open this year than at any point in history in the past. So that factors in, that's going to impact recovery. Uh, and then ADR recovers and then RevPAR recovers. So recovery is uh, involves a lot of different metrics and what can help. Interesting, I heard a speaker recently talk about a war room mentality. And, and this was a, a major hotel company that said, hey, you know, the situation is so unprecedented. We get all the major play, all the major players together in the room on a weekly basis, looking at our portfolio, what hotels are doing well, what areas, you know, destinations are doing well, and 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 we're making decisions on a on a much more uh, dynamic basis than we ever have before. Help trying to help our hotels and our destinations recover and and take advantage of what you know different hotels are doing well. We're applying it to other places as well. Um, SDR also tracks it. You know, everybody knows SDR tracks historic data, but we track forward looking data as well. And that's been very, very valuable during this time. Here's forward looking data for uh, major cities in Europe. And you see lots of uh, spikes. All of these spikes are related to events that are coming up in the near future. Look in November. That's uh, the uh, UN climate conference, climate change conference in Glasgow. Um, now that we're looking at Edinburgh here, and it's overflowed to Edinburgh, but Glasgow is 90% full related to that. So that kind of forward-looking data has been real, real critical as well. So. Good. Just a, a little bit of information. Don't hesitate to let me know. Drop. Uh, don't hesitate if uh, if you want the uh, forecast uh, or you want the presentation. <laughs> let me know. Feel free to send me an email. Perfect. Many thanks, Steve, and also many thanks uh, for your continuous support of Academia of uh, SDR Share Center. Greatly appreciate it. Also, as you mentioned, uh, that not all destinations are created equal. Also, for instance, Austrian hotels had a very good summer season last summer because German tourists could not go to Italy, to Spain, Turkey, for instance. So they chose nearby destinations. So they had a good summer, for instance. So also pretty important observation, actually. Good. Uh, perfect. Many thanks. I don't see any other questions at the moment. So let's move um, uh, to uh, Anu Liu, our last presenter for today and his topic, Timing Matters, Crisis Severity, and Occupancy Rate Forecast in Social Unrest Periods, also highlighting a different aspect of forecasting in turbulent times. The floor is yours. Thank you, Uli. So I'm Ayu Liu from University of Surrey. So let's move our eyes from the pandemic to another another turbulent period, which is in Hong Kong in 2019. So this is a paper I co-authored uh, co with uh, Dr. Richard Chu and uh, Dr. Jason Stamets and also Ms. Yang Yu. So and ha this paper has just been accepted by the International Journal of Contemporary Research. Uh, Hospitality Research, sorry. <laughs> so, oops. Okay, this is outline of the presentation it starts from the background, followed by the literature review, methodology, and data, and then I'll present the main findings and conclusions. So we know what happened in Hong Kong in 2019, in the second second half of, the, of that year, the social unrest. And if we look at the occupancy rate of Hong Kong from 2018 to 19, we can see a big drop in 2019 particularly the second half of the year. At that time, I remember people in Hong Kong, the industry said that all oh, the winter comes. But then after, when we were in 2020, people realized how to define a winter because in, in 2020, we have the pandemic. So the question is that uh, we know from the literature or from our own experience, when we have risk, when we perceive risk in the destination, so we will either cancel our trip or we would like to postpone our trip. Then the quest the question is how to produce uh, how to produce the forecast for the industry when they are in the in a turbulent period. We say in that time in that period the traditional forecasting methods may not work because it, we we do have very good track record in terms of forecasting using the low frequency data for example quarterly data monthly data but think about the uh, the demonstration in Hong Kong only lasts for six, or was it, we say six months. If we if we use quarterly data, the data may be less than two observation points. 
But if we use monthly data, maybe only six points, the data is not long enough to generate uh, uh, to generate a satisfied forecast, accurate forecast. So in this case, the daily data and the social media data come always a big data. Because if we, we talk about the demonstration in Hong Kong, six months, which means if we use daily data, it's about 180 observations. And if we talk about social media, the, we talk about big data, the, the sample size will be much larger. So in this study, we would like to use the social media data coverage as a proxy of the severity of the demonstration. We know that when people perceive or they can they predict the severity of the demos demonstration, then they can further adjust their schedule, their uh, trip in the future. And the research question of this study is that if the introduction of social media, da media data can improve the forecasting accuracy during a crisis. So we would like to use three traditional time series models, including SRIMA, e ETS, STL, and their combination. I remember there is a question in the Q&A box that asks, what is the mathematical model to do the forecast during the crisis, or is it during the turbulent periods? Well, you can you can see from the previous presenters presentation, there is no model can work well in all the situations. So in that case, we need to select the model very carefully, particularly in the crisis period. We also introduced the social media to these three time series models. So we can we we also have another four interventional model which are SMRA called. SRIMA X, ETS X, STL X, and their combination. And in terms of the data, so thank you, Steve, again, to sharing the data from STR to this study. We got the data from STR for the 2019 daily Hong Kong occupancy rate by different hotel classes. And we also collect the most popular hashtags related to the social unrest in Hong Kong from Twitter because, well, as, because we know that there are other types of social medias which can be used to still uh, to represent the severity of the crisis but uh, for example facebook which is not allowed us to use data and for some data which are not uh, form officially available from the chinese social medias so so twitter is the only i would say the available data source for us and let's look at the dis descriptive statistics so this is the daily occupancy rate of the of Hong Kong hotels. And we can see in different segments, the bottom appeared in different months. For example, for the luxury and upper, upper, upper scale, probably the, the strongest impact happened in August, September. Again, here is September. September, September, and but from the demonstration perspective, this I think we can. Uh, if we look at uh, the this, this should be from November. So there is some time difference, and we we also need to consider this time difference the delay in our modeling. So we will use the data of June to September, which is around ninety observations to forecast the occupancy in October, and we also choose another building window which is July to October, and then forecast occupancy in November to make the forecasting results more robust. And from the performance perspective, we use MAP and RMSE to measurement to measure the forecasting performance. And for, we will forecast from one day ahead to 14 days ahead forecast, daily forecast. Then let's look at the results. Well, this is not the MTR map of Hong Kong. This is just the forecasting results. So if we look at uh, the horizontal lines, which represents, <coughs> which represents one day ahead forecast to 14 days for ahead forecast, because we have eight methods. So basically the line, line chart here represents the rank of these eight methods, which means the vertical line is the rank. For example, one means one means this method performed best among the eight methods. And uh, if, if the method ranked eight, that means it's the worst, uh, it performed the worst. 
So in general, we can see the dotted line represent the traditional methods. The, the straight line represent the intervention models, which means the model with social media data. Then if we compare their performance, we can see in all the cases, all the segments, at least one interventional model, one model with the social media data, social media data perform best among the eight, which means if we take October as the forecasting period, the interventional model worked better than the traditional models. No, no matter we evaluated the forecasting performance by MAPE or RMSC. But when we look at the forecasting results in November, for the luxury class, it's okay. The interventional models still work. For the upper upper scale, still work. For the upper upscale and uh, upper middle, kind of mix. And if we look at the mixed mixed class, uh, if we look at middle scale class, it's, it's just a mess, <laughs> particular for the MAPE. So what then we, we should think about what is the reason behind why the model worked well in October, but not in November. It's about is related is because of data or because of the model. At least from here, what we can argue is that in general, we can say intervention models are more accurate compared to the traditional models. And if we talk about the forecasting performance indices, RMS, RMSE is more supportive to intervention models. And let's go back to the previous question, why the model, models don't work in November? Let's look at uh, the box the boxes. We know that for the box chart, the bottom and the top indicates the 25 and the 75 percentage. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, indicated the 25 and the 75 uh, yes, percentage. And if we look at the luxury hotel, upper upper scale, the variance in November is larger than the variance fluctuation of the other three classes. When there is, this means when the demonstration is still, ha, uh, still has impact on the occupancy rate. We, because, because of the impact, then there is a big fluctuation. So when the, in, uh, when the demonstration still has impact on the occupancy rate, then the intervention model works. But for the rest of three segments, which means people, are cost, uh, people have, have already adjusted their behaviors because they have experienced the demonstration for three or four, four months. They are familiar with the situation. So the impact of the demonstration on the hotel performance is not as strong as to the other to the, the other two classes. So in this case, that's why the intervention uh, the intervention model didn't work well in these three segments in November, but still work well in the first two segments. And uh, in general, the conclusion of this study is in addition to the first two, we have another two uh, two another two findings. The daily data model with social media data can we say cannot be traditional models in, we say, in normal period. And, but the daily data models with social media data can perform better during the crisis. So the practical implication here is that during the crisis, maybe it's for the industry, industry we should consider to include the social media data in the daily forecast. And this is the pres presentation from me. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Anu, uh, for this very interesting presentation, but also for this very important aspect of research that you have been analyzing with your colleagues. 
At the moment, I do not see any uh, questions uh, on the part of the attendees. I mean, you're still invited to, to, to ask questions, for instance, by uh, using the Q&A box or by using the raise hand function also. So just let us know. But um, we still have time to, to um, uh, at the, at now towards the end of the seminar. So maybe I will just ask maybe one or two questions uh, to the panelists in, in general. Thank you again for all your um, uh, excellent presentations and uh, wonderful insights. I mean, what we have seen is that methodologies and also measures to some extent had to be adjusted during the, during the forecasting in turbulent times for the pandemic, for the social unrest, for instance. According to your opinion, what, what tools, uh, what uh, models are likely to remain within the forecaster's toolbox even after the turbulent times when everything is hopefully going normal again? What could we learn? Maybe somebody who wants to. Right, I have a go first. Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, during the crisis period, uh, we can see all the presenters, uh, apart from IUs, actually use the judgmental adjustment. This is because uh, the traditional uh, statistical econometric models will not be uh, will not work because uh, the impact, uh, COVID-19 impact, is a factor that was not built in uh, the model. Mm -hmm. So it cannot predict uh, with, uh, with this uh, external shocks. So that is important to incorporate uh, the judgmental approach into uh, statistical forecasting models. Mm -hmm. But if after the COVID-19 passed, uh, when things return to normal, uh, I would think that uh, uh, the traditional model will still be uh, mm -hmm. useful. I think we'll still uh, uh, find the traditional model will be useful. And the COVID-19 period uh, will be, uh, the impact will be incorporated uh, one way or another in the model, either by a dummy variable uh, approach or mm -hmm. maybe other intervention uh, methods. Uh, so I would say in the future, traditional model will still be useful. But of course, uh, new uh, approaches will be uh, developed as a result of this uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, I think uh, in the future, more uh, emphasis will be more on uh, a combination of uh, statistical forecast mm -hmm. and uh, quality forecast. I think that's probably will be something uh, uh, a little bit new uh, in, in terms of methodology. Uh, that mm -hmm. uh, will be uh, relevant and useful in the future. Perfect. Uh, many thanks, uh, Professor Song, for these important insights. I'm just seeing that we have two raised hands from the attendees, uh, Yasmin Mata and SC Tushara. Uh, maybe uh, your questions first, uh, Ms. Mata, maybe you were first, as according to my list at least. Please go ahead. I think probably Gang had to mute, unmute them. Could be, yes. Yes, I have just done that. <laughs> uh, just me. Hello. Speak. Yeah. Hello, hello. Yeah, please go ahead. No, I'm Mr. Gangli, thank you very much first to all. Very interesting. Um, part of my question was already responded in, in the chat box, but mainly was if one is faced with a destination, which is a new destination and has almost no history or there is no data available, and was about to be positioned by the government just a bit before the pandemic, what would you recommend would be the right forecasting methodology? Because it's, I'm personally, I'm, I'm in South America, there's not much data on the Americas. It's usually only Brazil and Mexico, which is analyzed even by STR. Um, we're in a group based in Peru. So it would be interesting just having your feedback how would you go about the approach of analyzing something where the historical data is or flawed with lots of error or, or just does not yet exist? I typed in uh, some answers already. Maybe other panelists can further elaborate. So can I go first? Yeah, I think that's a very good question and very challenging task. Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, 
trust. But if there is no data, data is not enough. Maybe I think, but we do have qualitative methods to do the forecast. And also mm -hmm. the forecast is one another option. And when we have a little bit data, then I think maybe we can try to integrate big data into the model, which can have faster reaction than the traditional, we say, low frequency data. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any thanks? So this is definitely a very important question. Uh, there was also another question about which software tools to use. And I think uh, Andrea Saman said that they used R in their uh, specific, uh, for their specific paper. I mean, this is also used more often, according to my own experience, because many new models are also programmed uh, in R and are not available yet in other more traditional statistical software tools. And uh, maybe also one question of, are there something from uh, the Q&A box still? So one question is there, I'm going to read it out by uh, Karan Kapoor. How and why did the researchers uh, come about drawing a correlation between social media and tourism forecasting, considering social media are not used as booking channels? Also, can airline data and tourism arrivals data be used for hotel occupancy forecasting? I think this is the mm -hmm. question to me. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and uh, well, because we use the social media data to uh, to represent the severity of the demonstration. So, and uh, the rationale here is that because uh, if people people realize that uh, there will be a very se severe, we say, demonstration, social unrest in Hong Kong, so they will cancel or postpone their trips. That's why we used it as a as an independent variable in the model. And yes, it's yes, social media data is not used in the booking channels, but I think this the severity of the social unrest could be could influence the demand of the hotels. And uh, the other question is air data and tourism arrival data can be used for hotel occupancy forecasting. I think they are correlated, but at least from my perspective, when we do, when we establish, develop the forecast, forecast, forecasting models, we need to start from the theoretical perspective. We would like to build up the, the model from the demand side. We don't, really, we don't use the, uh, the airline data to forecast the, we can, we can, but at least from the economic perspective, we would like to develop a model based on economic theories. Okay, many thanks. Um, who wants if to I can just, yeah. If I can just jump in on that one, um, we I have done a project, a couple projects with uh, Google before, where where we correlated search data with um, demand and and looked at the the uh, the um, the the weight or the uh, the length, you know, between this between an increase in search data and then the the demand that was sort of interesting. I'll be glad to get you information on that and uh, introduce you to people from Google if anybody's interested. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, correlations recently with the airline data in the U.S. There's a uh, TSA does uh, counts of travelers through the airports and and that's been a very interesting correlation. Um, but it's been different, you know. You could see the airline data jumped up during the uh, during the Christmas holidays, for example. But you could see that the hotels didn't jump up as much. Normally, it was a good correlation, but during Christmas, you know, people fly, but they stay with mom and dad and or grandma and mm -hmm. grandpa. So uh, interesting correlations there. But it's but it's definitely useful during normal situations. And, uh, and so uh, that's another example of a correlation we didn't look as closely at uh, prior to uh, this that, that we are now. Perfect, many thanks. I think uh, Jesse Zhao, you also raised your hand. You wanted to comment something because we are, oh, maybe that was just a mistake then. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> just, uh, just as visible to me maybe. Okay, okay. perfect. Uh, yeah, Andrea, you want to say right. something? Yes, I, I can also add that in general, we think of transport demand as a derived demand. So, um, so transport is not the input, it's, it's sort of the derivative, this is the derived demand. So transport demand comes from the demand for the destination and not the other way around. Um, so um, that, that's just from a theoretical point of view. 
Perfect. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, this was a different common, uh, a very useful and sensible comment for the end of this uh, webinar, actually, because now time is up and I also don't see any further questions um, anymore. I mean, uh, supply and demand data would be a solution in the COVID, uh, post-COVID period. Probably, yes. I mean, uh, as long as there's a theoretical foundation for including certain variables and data are available, this is probably a good idea, of course, also worth, uh, uh, say, more thorough investigating investigation in case uh, uh, one wants to analyze a, a specific forecasting problem. Okay, uh, time is up now. So 90 minutes. We were perfectly in time, I think. I, again, uh, sincerely thank all the, uh, the distinguished guest speakers for all the inputs on their latest findings and the latest research. So uh, this was really, um, say, a fruitful learning experience for everyone. I also thank all the attendees for uh, spending your time with us, attending the, uh, the webinar, and also for spending your time with us. I hope you found everything interesting. So with this, I would like to conclude the webinar and wish you all a good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you're located. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.